of these knights, Sir Ralph, Sir Thomas and Sir Edward. We've limited these to 500, that's throughout the world, so this is an investment. So you can get these in America if you... I was going to say they will go to America. Yeah. Yeah. At Royal Doulton, one of Lord Cowdray's companies, a sudden burst of royal pageantry has given temporary respite from the worst of the recession. Exactly the same. The royal wedding means a flourishing demand from overseas for images of Britain's past. For tourists, these are the very stuff of Merry England. Yet these images come from a one-sided picture of Britain's history a history of kings and queens and knights on horseback. It's often said that the history of Britain could be written on the back of a horse. From Norman conquest to Cromwell, the loyal knight defended the status quo. In this, the civil war of the 17th century, Britain faced its own revolution. But the revolution failed, and monarchy lived on. Its princes have included Britain's richest landowners. Being royalty, the holdings of the crown can be estimated from official documents. But there, the journey ends. For the rest of Britain's 43 million acres, the spread of ownership is a mystery. In 1979, the Northfield Committee, an official body set up by the government, published its report on the ownership of Britain's land. But despite its official powers, it made very little progress in actually unravelling the truth. The report concluded, Throughout our work, we were hampered by the lack of detailed information. It is disturbing that so little is known about the pattern of acquisition, ownership and occupancy of agricultural land. By careful digging, we managed to piece together some of the fragments. Even then, the figures are misleading. If all land is equal, some is more equal than the rest. The Duke of Westminster's acres in Belgravia, for example, are worth literally billions. Lord Leverhulme inherited nearly 100,000 acres in Cheshire and Scotland, a fortune based almost entirely on the making of soap. And the fortunes of Lord Vesty have grown all the faster for avoiding the ravages of taxation. The Duke of Atoll is a Scottish peer of long history, but what the bare facts ignore is that he is related by marriage to this man, the third Viscount Cowdray, 88,000 acres, family name Pearson, a dynasty that turned from industry to pageantry in three generations. Charles Pearson out in front, picks it up nicely. And a lovely pass there from Withers to Pearson. Pearson coming up to the goal, hits it forward, Berantis comes back for it. Just he backs it, more, Pereira's on his own, Withers going back. Charles Pearson is most at home on the polo field. Michael Pearson, Lord Cowdray's heir, is a tax exile with homes in Monte Carlo and Ibiza. Through prudent marriage, the Pearsons have built an awe-inspiring dynasty. The names are straight from the better pages of Burke's peerage. Spencer, Blakenham, Churchill, Lord Gibson, Lord Poole, and the Duke of Atoll. Three generations of Pearsons rose through the ranks of the British aristocracy from humble Yorkshire roots. Their wealth and power came from a vast construction company built on the back of Britain's Victorian Empire. These mementos of Wheatman Pearson's achievements are evidence of the global reach of 19th century Britain. His was a business empire built by the energy of one of the giants of Britain's Industrial Revolution. 
but the wealth that came from industry was used in a typically British way. Wheatman D. Pearson was created a baronet in 1894, Baron Cowdray of Midhurst in 1910, and Viscount Cowdray in 1917. Wheatman Pearson was known in Parliament as the member for Mexico, and hardly surprising. It's said that he took more money out of Mexico than any man since the conqueror Cortez. That money was used to build a dynasty here on earth, the Cowdray dynasty. The reward of great men is in their conscience and in the opinion of posterity. So what sort of chap do you think he was? I think he was a person who was incredibly proud of his achievements. Uh, Megalomaniac? Um, I don't know. Certainly, I feel he uh, was determined that what he was achieving should not go unrecorded. Worth Abbey in Sussex still carries the hallmarks of the Cowdray style. Used by the first Viscount as a hunting lodge, it was sold to the Benedictines for a monastery. To the casual visitor, it has all the flavour of a feudal manor, built by a modern baron to recreate the privileged lifestyle of the Middle Ages. But there was a tremendously strict discipline when he passed. Nobody was allowed to talk, you had to stand to attention and raise your cap or whatever you had on. Lots what about the coat of arms over the fireplace? Uh, that is one of many uh, all over the building. He never seems to tire of enjoying his own coat of arms. And um, at any possible opportunity, he'll put it up in ceilings, in fireplaces, on doors, in carvings, in staircases. Everywhere there are the two sons and the griffin. He was very used to winning, though. Do it with thy might. Oh, yes. Um, and I wouldn't bridge anything less than winning and winning handsomely. The spoils of victory are not to be taken lightly. Midhurst is Mecca in the world of polo. There's 60,000 acres in Scotland and a business empire of more than 1,000 million pounds. Ladies and gentlemen on the far side, you are more than welcome to come over and witness the presentation. Would you please come along? Because polo without an audience is just chuckers. Calgary Park Gold Cup will be presented by Lord Cowdery's daughter-in-law, Mrs. Michael Pearson. In the absence of Michael Pearson, the Pearson Empire is grooming a successor in Michael Hare, the son of Lord Cowdery's sister, Lady Blakenham. But this dynasty of marriages is also the ruling family of a vast business empire. An empire that intrudes into every corner of the British economy. It is May the 30th, and at the Pearson headquarters in London, the directors gather for their annual general meeting. This year, the Pearson group will declare a profit of 53 million pounds, and Lord Cowdray, now 70, will submit himself for re-election to the board. The Pearson profits are made from an ever-growing list of business ventures, from table snacks to the waxwork effigies of Madame Tussauds, including Sir Geoffrey Howe. Recent acquisitions include the feudal bastion of Warwick Castle, built by a close ally of William the Conqueror. In the annual report, company chairman Lord Gibson records, I welcome wholeheartedly the ending of controls over wages, prices, dividends and overseas investment. These four freedoms provide a more bracing climate in which to work. The Pearson assets now include some 375 company names, and, perhaps appropriately, they include the leading publications of the business world, The Banker, World Business Weekly, Money Management, The Investor's Chronicle, The Economist, The Financial Times, as well as a fast-spreading network of local newspapers. The Pearson annual report and accounts are approved unanimously. Lord Cowdray, having reached the legal retirement age of 70, offers his resignation and is re-elected to the board. Close by on the London stock market, meanwhile, a strange development had occurred. 
In the words of Lord Cowdrey's own Financial Times, an invisible crash is taking place in share prices. The market has split itself into two. While financial, service and oil companies have been moving ahead breezily, the valuation of Britain's manufacturing industry has been knocked down. Facts such as those seem elusive to the untrained eye, but they're there to be found in the dense pages of the financial press, most of them published by the Pearson Group. The Pearson Company, for one, has seen the opportunity in Britain's industrial crisis. Land and information have become, yet again, the foundations of power. There's an old saying in the city, sell in May and go away. Like many British institutions, the Cowdrey Empire now sees investment overseas as the best strategy for survival. In North America, the Midhurst Corporation, named after Cowdrey's Sussex estate, plays a central role. Says Lord Gibson in the annual report, I give pride of place to Midhurst, where we have a long-term programme of redeploying our substantial United States assets. With profits falling in British industry, thousands of other companies have followed suit. Since exchange controls were lifted in 1979, investment abroad has turned into a flood. Government figures put the number of unemployed in Britain at its highest May level since the Second World War. The coming of industry brought jobs and democratic wealth to Britain. Mass production would mean a new deal for millions of British families. That at least was the promise. Now it seems industry is dying and the promise of democratic wealth is fading away. What price democracy now? <laughs>